All right, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's the top of the hour, 10 a.m. Pacific time. We can get started. I'm Daniela Rachiti. I am a curator at Warm Base. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our last webinar of the 2020 2021 Warm Base webinar series. In today's webinar, Wen Chen and Eduardo Beltrame uh, will talk about the high throughput expression data. Wen will show you how you can navigate expression cluster data in Warm Base, and she will introduce you to Spell. Spell is a query driven, driven search engine for large. Um, large gene expression microarray and RNA-seq compendia. After Wen's presentation, Eduardo will give an overview on current tools being developed to analyze the single cell data. A couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. The presentation itself will take about 40 minutes followed by 20 minutes uh, Q&A session. Uh, please mute your microphones throughout the presentation and wait for the Q&A session to begin before asking questions. At the end of the presentation, you will be able to unmute yourself, but if you feel more comfortable, you can also write your questions in the chat. Uh, the webinar, including the Q&A session, will be recorded and will be posted at a later date on YouTube. Uh, we will inform you uh, via the warm based blog when it will be available. If you have additional questions after the, web the webinar or you need further clarifications, you can always reach us at help at warmbase.org. Again, it's help at warmbase.org. Thank you again for joining us. We are really pleased that you're all here. So without further ado, here's our speakers for the day, Wen and Eduardo. Wen, are you ready to start? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Daniela. And uh, let me start to share my screen. So greetings from Pasadena, California. I'm Wen Chen. I have been with OneBase uh, since 2000, year 2000. And we, we started to curate um, high throughput expression since the microarray time. And in the past 20 years, we have seen uh, exponential growth of data coming to the field and we can barely keep up with the growth of technology. So we decided to focus on the essential biological information of high throughput data, um, the differentially expressed genes. And if you look at all the publications of high throughput, whether it's microarray, pro proteomics, or like uh, RNA-seq or single cell RNA-seq, um, usually uh, researchers do these experiments uh, to answer uh, questions like they're interested in. For example, like they want to know how will a mutation changes the expression level of the whole genome, or they want to know where these genes, you know, is enriched, um, you know, in certain tissue, and, and they want to know if I apply a drug uh, to this nematode and what will happen to the expression uh, of the genome. And all of these, like, were published, usually are published as tables of differentially expressed genes uh, in the supplementary material. So in one base, uh, all the curation we to uh, follow a schema, or you can say it's a template. So we have a template to say, okay, we want to curate differentially expressed genes and from the high throughput uh, expression analysis. And we call this kind of data expression cluster. And here is a schema or the template of expression uh, clusters. And you know, usually it's just a list of genes that show the differential expression. And that can be uh, discovered by microarray or proteomics or RNA-seq or tiling array. And we will see like how these genes are regulated, like it could be regulated by another gene, mutations of another gene, and can be immune response or heat shock or starvation and causes the differential expression, or it can be drug response. It can be regulated by molecule or chemical substance. And we can also tell like uh, from the expression cluster, the enrichment of these list genes. Maybe it's a list of genes that show the exp differential expression between pharynx. And if, if you compare uh, tissue specific uh, expression in pharynx and, and compare it with whole animal. And then in one base, like uh, each expression cluster is a subject, like uh, showing a list of genes and the species and, uh, and how they were regulated. And in the current one base WS280, we have more than 3,000 expression clusters. 
annotated from 732 primary research articles. So we are talking about more than 3,000 lists of genes, and each list contains hundreds of genes. And you wonder, hey, where do we find these lists? And actually, you see them on every gene page. On every gene page, under the expression widget, there's a section called expression cluster. And every gene has like dozens or, or a few hundred lists associated with them. For example, in the gene ensum 5 on the expression cluster widget, like you see like a expression class, these genes involved in expression clusters, like showing that it's enriched in nucleus and it's expressed in testing and tells you like the genetic interactions. So it's regulated by AL, ALG2, EMB4, or like, you know, you can also see the treatment, like these genes expression changes when animals were starved or the physical interaction, it physically interacts with like a gene target, like this is a protein com com uh, complex, and or like you know, other drug response, like if you apply certain chemicals to the worm, uh, these genes expression level will change. So ensum 5 actually is a, is a pretty novel gene. People know very little about this, but this high throughput data uh, information already uh, put the researchers in a good starting point because even though this gene was rarely studied, nobody did expression pattern analysis, nobody knew any phenotype of it, you already know a lot from the high throughput data uh, from the expression clusters we annotated. And so uh, there are a lot of information from expression clusters. Like I just showed you on ensum 5 there were 66 expression clusters in WS280. And we have a short summary of these expression clusters on the overview page, overview section of each gene. Sometimes we display some uh, uh, summary, like, oh, this is genes affected by certain other genes based on microarray or RNA-seq. But the overview is the concise description of gene function, like it has a limit of of a uh, number of uh, words we can put there. So you usually do not see the whole summary of expression clusters. If you want to see the whole summary of the expression clusters, you can use SimpleMind tool. Uh, under the tools menu, if you click SimpleMind, you'll be taken to our SimpleMind uh, uh, tool. Like uh, this is a very simple, um, a very handy tool for researchers to get essential gene inf information for a list of genes. And it has information about a nine nematode species, and it can choose to have like a HTML di display or to download a tab delimited file. And SimpleMind is a very good tool for uh, for you to convert uh, identifiers, gene names, like you know, to get like the you know uh, uh, like uh, names in other databases, or like uh, you can get essential information like genetics information, phenotype interaction. And under the expression widget, you see these two options, genomic study tissue and genomic study life stage. And those were the uh, anatomy and the developmental life stage derived from high throughput data. And also under functional annotation, you can choose expression cluster summary. And if you choose these three options in Simple Mind, you can enter a list of genes or you can get all genes in this species and then you can click the query list uh, button and then you get a tab delimited file showing you all the tissues enriched, uh, you know, with that, that G these genes enriched in and the life stage of these genes expressed and a, a, a long text of uh, summary uh, from all the expression clusters associated with these genes. So all of these we talked about are just text. And, but some people prefer like a, to have some better video ex, uh, effect, like you know they want to see a better display of this information. And I want to introduce you to uh, the expression graphs in Wormbase. So also under the expression widget, there's a section called expression profiling graphs. And so you will see a few images of this under almost every gene page of C. elegans. And if you, these are actually uh, picture files submitted by authors. And most of them are about the live stages and like a study by microarray or RNA-seq. And if you click on these uh, graphs, uh, you see um, the legends of these figures, like uh, these were 
prepared by the authors. And if you click on these images again, you see the details about this um, you know, expression level change according to the developmental life stages. And again, these are all um, picture files and legends submitted by authors from those high throughput data. And in one base, we also have our in-house display of RNA-seq FPKM expression data selected from modern code libraries. So it's also under the expression widget, you see this whole section of every gene, uh, genes page, and you see like how the uh, expression level changes um, in the life stage, in the developmental life stage. So these are the RNA-seq data derived from modern code that one base map them to the current genome in every build. And oftentimes we got ask, uh, asked by users uh, in, to our help desk say, hey, this is really cool. How can we download the, the value, the expression value, the, the numbers uh, that, you, you, that you use to build the expression graph? And here we introduce you to this tool called RNA-seq FPKM search. It's under the tools menu. You can click this tool and it will take you to this RNA-seq FPKM genome search. And you have to choose a species. Species By default, it's C. elegans, but we also have uh, RNA-seq from other nematodes. And you enter a list of gene names. And then you can filter, like, uh, do you want to have expression level in wire type or mutant? And you can choose life stage or whether you want a whole animal or tissue specific. And you can also cheat, uh, choose uh, treatment, like you know, you know, drug response or other treatment. And then you click the query list button and you will see um, a table. You can choose HTML display or you download the whole table as type delimited file you can open in Excel. And you see all these sample names, those are like uh, SR, SRA, like from NCBI and the species, the strain, life stages, and a list of FPKM value of these uh, genes that you entered. So in one base, we have over 1,000 RNA-seq analysis. So, so like uh, the full table will, will contain more than 1,000 experiments. And of course, you can filter, like uh, depending on what kind of tissue or life stage or strain or treatment you want to see, and you can download them. And then like people ask us, hey, I don't want to see a couple of genes. I want the whole data set. And how do we get that? And now I'm going to show you another tool called Expression Dataset Locator. So under the tools menu, here's another option you can choose uh, to, to, to see like uh, expression uh, data sets in one base. So in one base, we have uh, more than 400 uh, high throughput data sets uh, curated with their expression value, the whole genome level. And you can choose um, which platform because we have RNA-seq, microarray, tiling array, and proteomic studies. And you can choose the species uh, among the nine nematode species we collected, tissue specific or whole animal. And we also have a list of topics uh, annotated to these data sets. For example, I want to see all the uh, topics, all the high school study related to aging. So I can click the aging option and with RNA-seq and C. elegans and whole animal. And I will see a table of all the high throughput data sets in one base. And I can, I can follow this link to go back, to go to the gene expression omnibus to see the raw data, to download the raw data. And here's a platform. And I can also download a tab delimited file of all these uh, FPKM values like map to the current genome. So for example, if you use our uh, data set locator now, the downloadable file will take you to um, the genome that I mapped to WS280, the current genome. And so this is a data set locator. So finally, I'm going to introduce one base spell. Uh, it's, a not, it's not a new tool, but it's still very, very useful because there's nothing like that in the field. So one base spell is a tool that allows you to do search uh, for other genes that has, uh, have similar expression profile as your favorite genes. So under the tools menu, you can click spell and it will take you to the spell website. So as I mentioned, the one base, we have more than 400 data sets representing almost 7,000 experiments, and they can be microarray or tiling array or proteomics or, or like RNA-seq. 
So you can enter gene name, for example, LI1. Okay, someone studying LI1 say, hey, this is a new gene. I have no idea what it does, and but I want to see, you know, uh, what other genes co-express with it, and then that can help me to figure out which pathway uh, it is involved. So if you just enter a simple search, entering one gene in spell, you will see a list of genes um, with similar expression profiles in almost every data set. So here's they are ran how they are ranked, like with the highest correlation, and then you see the list here, and you can download this list as text, and then you can study these genes one by one. You can take them to SimpleMind and do a quick search to see what the functions of these genes are, where they're expressed, and um, you know all the phenotypes related to them. And the spell also, uh, also does uh, gene ontology uh, enrichment to tell you all the biological processes uh, involved in this list of genes that showed you um, co-expression with LI1. So this is like the simple search of uh, clustering analysis in SPELL. And I want to remind you like SPELL actually is a very smart tool. Um, the search I just told you, like a single gene search is an unweighted clustering analysis. For example, like we have um, 400 data sets, right? And so, okay, like if you only enter one gene and SPELL will look at every data set and see like how well other genes correlate with your gene in this data set. And every data set has an equal weight. But then people wonder, hey, what about if you have a bad set data set? What about if authors did crappy work and they have poor quality? Isn't that going to contaminate the result? Uh, yes, we try our best to annotate the highest quality, um, high throughput data set and put them in one base. Um, but Spell also have a smart way to, to like improve its quality. For example, if you have multiple genes in your mind that you already know that they co-express, for example, OMA1, OMA2, they are like kind of redundant and they always express together. So if you do OMA1 search, just one gene, you do, uh, the spell will do an unweighted clustering, will give you a list of genes, uh, like consider every gene, every data set uh, equal weight. But if you enter two genes, then they serve as a positive control. Spell would look at every data set to see how well OMA1, OMA2 correlate. Uh, in these data sets because these serve as a positive uh, control. When you enter multiple genes, you're telling Spell that these two genes, they always co-express and you can evaluate your current data sets based using my positive control. And those data sets with the highest correlation of these two genes gets the highest weight. And then like a Spell will give more weight to this data set. And those poor quality data sets, they may have a lower correlation and then they get less weight. And if they're really bad quality spell, probably will eliminate them. So if you enter two genes, like OMA1, OMA2, you see like actually the, the result is slightly different from a single gene search because spell weighted uh, every data set. Um, so this is just a, a weighted clustering result in spell. So this, um, I'm going to end my presentation here because these are all we have, or most of what we have uh, ready to use in one base about high throughput data. And we really appreciate if you can give us feedback on what we uh, have been doing and what will be the top priorities for us. And I'm going to give the microphone to Eduardo. He's going to tell you uh, the prototypes of tools that we're developing for single cell RNA-seq. Uh, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now. All right, so hi everybody. I'm Eduardo. I'm a graduate student in Paul Sternberg's lab. And I have been working uh, with Warmbase to think about what tools could we bring, could we develop uh, for users to visualize single cell RNA-seq data. Um, and Everything that I'm going to talk to you today 
uh, 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 is still in development. And so we want your feedback. Everything that I'm going to show you today uh, is an idea or you know late development stage, but nothing is set on stone. And we want to hear from you what you think is best uh, for your needs. If you have worked with single cell data before, if you have specific uh, suggestions. So first of all, for those uh, who might not uh, have dealt with single cell data before, uh, why do people care about it so much? Uh, and the difference between single cell RNA-seq and bulk RNA-seq is essentially the same difference between that of uh, tasting a smoothie or tasting the individual berries. If you have a tissue that has a lot of heterogeneity where you were not able to purify a single cell type, um, you get an average of expression of different cell types. Uh, if you're able to, to have a very good pure uh, bulk sample, uh, then the profile will resemble that of individual cells of that type. Um, but with single cell, you can taste all the berries uh, at once uh, without uh, confounding their flavor. Uh, and that's very, very powerful. Um, single cell is a very young technique. Uh, it followed on the footsteps of uh, bulk RNA-seq. And in the beginning, what people would do is they would uh, just do bulk RNA-seq in individual wells where they had isolated individual cells. Um, then they started uh, you know, using bigger plates and they started using microfluidics uh, to separate cells in, in, in wells. They started using uh, liquid handling robots to, to do that. And a big breakthrough uh, for the field came in 2015 when you had these two papers back to back published in Cell, uh, where they what they did was they used uh, microfluidics to create an emulsion uh, droplets that had one cell in each droplet, and they had also a bead that contained a DNA barcode. Um, since then. Uh, there have been other uh, techniques introduced to do that. Uh, people have done that with pico wells, which are like, you know, 20 nanometer wells that are so small that you can only have a single cell in, in a well, you can fit two of them. Uh, and uh, in situ barcoding, where instead of physically separating the cells, you split them, add a barcode, pull them together, mix them, split them again, add the next barcode and do that three or four times such that in the end, each cell has a unique barcode. Um, and the beginnings and the evolution of the field are reviewed in this paper uh, by Valentine Svensson. Um, and notice that it, it was right around 2017 that uh, Tenex Genomics uh, came to market, uh, which is a droplet-based method. Uh, and, what, and what this paper highlights is the exponential increase uh, in single cell data sets coming out. Um, but it stops in 2017. So last year, uh, we made an update to this paper. So I worked with Valentine um, and we have this uh, database that, it, that you can access and uh, it, we keep it up to date. Uh, that shows that the growth has not stopped. Uh, we are still breaking records in number of cells uh, done in a single study uh, you know, every few months. But most importantly now, there's a lot of uh, studies coming out uh, that regularly do tens of thousands of cells because uh, with 10X technology that is uh, commonplace. And what this other plot uh, shows you is the breakdown in number of studies by technology. And you can see that now uh, about 60% of the studies that come out, they use uh, the 10X genomics technology. Uh, and that's because it's a commercially available kit that works. Um, it's very easy to use. Uh, as long as you're able to make a single cell suspension, you, you can run it on their kit. Um, 
And it's the same principle as drop seek or in drops, uh, which is make an emulsion, encapsulate uh, beads uh, and cells in an emulsion and perform the reverse transcription and perform the uh, library preparation. So uh, to date, we have over 1200 uh, single cell studies published. That's either preprints or papers uh, that, that have been published and contain at least one single cell uh, experiment. Uh, there's over a hundred techniques uh, that people use, which means that they mix and match different parts of the experimental workflow. Uh, but in reality, uh, most of these techniques, they are like made once and uh, beyond the outer lab, uh, people don't, don't end up really using them. So if you look at the top 10 techniques, uh, you will see that uh, there's a very uh, steep fall off with chromium taking the lead uh, by far. Uh, and this is, this, these numbers here are uh, not comprehensive uh, because there's a very, very long tail with hundreds of uh, other techniques that are used only a few times. If you look at the breakdown in terms of uh, which organisms people use, human and mouse uh, lead the pack with uh, almost a thousand studies uh, doing either human or mouse. Uh, and then there's a very, also a very, very long tail uh, in other uh, organisms. Uh, so in a sense, uh, human and mice have been, uh, you know, racing ahead of other uh, model organisms that uh, will benefit a lot uh, from single cell. And for C. elegans right now, uh, there are only five uh, papers that uh, have been published that did high throughput single cell uh, RNA-seq. And this will explode uh, over the next few years. And so we want to prepare the ground uh, for that. Um, very, very briefly, the single cell data looks, uh, looks exactly like uh, bulk RNA-seq data with the difference that because you add a barcode to each cell, you're able to separate uh, from which cell uh, each transcript came from. And then instead of having a single vector that shows you the abundances of each genes, you have a matrix uh, that uh, has the list of genes, but also the list of cells. And typically, this is what uh, the data actually looks like. You get your FASTQ file, and then you perform alignment, uh, which will output uh, this matrix, which uh, will usually have about 20,000 genes and 500,000 barcodes. But most of those barcodes, they are uh, they have very few reads because they could be empty droplets or they could be low quality. And so you perform some kind of barcode filtering. And then you end up uh, with something that looks like this, uh, a future gene count matrix that will have about 10,000 genes and about 20,000 cells. This varies experiment to experiment, could be you know uh, a few thousand genes, a few thousand cells, could be more cells depending on the size of the experiment. But this is uh, a typical uh, single cell experiment uh, that you can do today uh, with 10x. This will cost you about $3,000. Um, and this matrix is the fundamental object that you're dealing with when you're working with single cell data. Um, and to give you an idea of uh, the numbers uh, this matrix will usually have between five and 30,000 reads per cell. So you, you, you will have sampled um, up to you know, 30, 50,000 times uh, uh, the molecules in the cell. But because you have PCR duplicates, in reality, you get something more like 500 to 5,000 unique transcripts per cell. Because you add a barcode, you can tell apart uh, when you have a PCR copy versus when you really have a different uh, initial starting transcript. And you will see something between 10 and 20,000 genes, at least 
uh, once and you have usually between five and 20,000 cells in one run. And uh, uh, usually papers are not doing just a single run anymore. They're, they're doing a couple runs, sometimes in different conditions, sometimes uh, in replicates. And a, a run like this will usually cost about uh, $3,000 if you're using the, um, the 10X technology. Now, um, how to deal with single cell data. Um, this big sparse matrix of counts, it, it is a different mathematical object than, uh, than the bulk data. Uh, the, the sampling process that gives rise to the, to the, to the counts in the matrix uh, means that you have to use uh, different statistics to, to deal with it. Um, and because of the scale of the data and because of new techniques that are coming on uh, for dealing with this kind of data like machine learning techniques, the best way to deal with it is still up in the air. In the beginning, people uh, would very much copy and paste methods from bulk data, uh, but now there are some machine learning methods that are tailored to, to this kind of data that have been uh, giving really good results. And uh, it's the, the stuff that we are planning to use for the warm based tools. Now, uh, the fundamental workflow for dealing with single cell data is two steps. First, you have to stratify and then you have to compare your data. And what I mean by that is stratification means you need to label it. You need to uh, divide it in groups that you then want to compare. Uh, and usually this means you have to assign uh, cell type labels. You have to um, uh, tell apart which samples you multiplexed or you need to tell apart which individuals um, you had in your sample. And then once you have your cell types or individuals, you want to compare them. You want to uh, select only a certain cell type, or you want to compare two patients uh, and you want to see what is different between them, uh, what is similar. And uh, there are a couple ways uh, to perform these uh, comparisons. And it is uh, what we want to uh, let you do uh, with the single cell tools for warm days. Um, because luckily for us, the stratification step, which is the most labor intensive, it means that you have to look through your data, look at which marker genes are being expressed, perform some sanity checks, and then assign a label. That step is performed by the authors. And so we take in that data and we want to provide you tools to compare it uh, with other data sets or compare it uh, within the data set. And so, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, visualization, uh, how people actually uh, plot, uh, not in a quantitative manner, but in a, in a visual manner, the different groups that you have uh, in single cell data. Um, because you have a matrix uh, that is 10,000 dimensions, because you have 10,000 genes, uh, you had to figure a way to bring that down to two dimensions. Uh, and there are two popular techniques that people use to do that. Um, one is called TISNI, uh, which is uh, this one right here. And uh, the other, uh, sorry, this, this one is TISNI and this one is uh, UMAP. And all that I want to say about this is that it, it is a way to push together the cells that are similar, which are colored uh, according to uh, the label that uh, you're providing uh, and push apart things that are, that are different. But uh, because these techniques, they are uh, iterative, they, uh, the same data could provide, could create slightly different uh, visualizations. And you will see these blobs in every paper. Um, they are meant to give you uh, a sanity check that the groups that you are uh, ascribing, they, they seem to make sense. 
but you can't look at them and make any uh, immediate uh, quantitative conclusions. Um, so we uh, are not focusing on uh, creating TISNs and UMAPs. There are tons of good tools already to make that. We want to provide tools uh, to visualize the gene expression, uh, not the way that the data was uh, clustered. And so one quick word about uh, C. elegans in the context of single cell data. C. elegans uh, has a you know, almost unique advantage for single cell, which is that all the cell types are super well characterized and it has a super well-defined uh, development. And what this means is that if you make a good data set for a certain life stage and you, you are able to capture all cells that are present in that life stage, you're basically done. You don't need to uh, keep redoing it again and again and again, because for example, as is done with human brain or mice brain tissues, you're always finding new cell types. You have a good reference. Um, if you perform a new experiment, a new perturbation experiment, you can compare it to that reference. Uh, if the technology is uh, similar, if the life stage is similar. Um, and so what this means is that you will be able to annotate in the future new data sets that are coming online very quickly if you have a good reference. Uh, and so you will spend less time doing the boring things, which is munging through the data, making sure that the labels that you're picking make sense, and more time doing the exciting things, which is the, the comparisons that you want to do. Uh, and if you have a good reference, that means that you don't need that many cells in your experiment to, uh, to be sure that you, you, you captured a certain group. Uh, and so if you can do uh, a bit less cells per groups, that means you can do more groups overall uh, for the same price. And so very soon uh, we will be seeing massively parallel uh, perturbation experiments where you're just multiplexing, you know, dozens or hundreds of groups, um, which have, you know, a few hundred to a few thousand cells each instead of tens of thousands of cells uh, in each condition. And we are getting there very quick. Uh, the Sengen project has put out really good data uh, that mapped all neurons, all 302 neurons in uh, L4 uh, animals. And uh, Parker uh, at our data set from 2019 uh, put out a really good, uh, really well annotated data set uh, that performed a comprehensive mapping of embryogenesis. And so I'm sure that very quickly people will put out really good data set for uh, other life stages. Um, and uh, it will then be a matter of uh, just taking that well annotated data when you are performing your experiments, uh, using it to annotate your data and then doing the comparisons that you want. And so we need tools uh, that enable visual data analysis. Uh, and what do I mean by visual data analysis? Um, currently, there is, there is kind of a divide between the dry lab and the wet lab. You know, typical workflow is, uh, you know, the biologist doing the experiment uh, requests an analysis and gets back an Excel spreadsheet of results of, or, you know, differential express genes or something. And, and, and he, he looks at it and then he says, I don't know, but I wanted something slightly different. And then he requests it. And then, you know, a few days later gets it back. And this hinders uh, the speed at which you can uh, iterate. And so uh, what would be really powerful is to create tools that can enable this, this kind of data exploration uh, without intermediaries. You know, even when you have a simple static dashboard uh, that is able to pull in uh, things like gene ontology and, and gene uh, descriptions, 
that can already be uh, very powerful if it's done, you know, uh, for a specific uh, experiment, if it's tailored uh, uh, to the needs of uh, uh, a certain experimental design. And the good thing about single cell data is that it's all more or less uniform. And so we, we can uh, provide this kinds of tools. And so I'm going to walk you through uh, what we are building and we want your feedback uh, on, on what you think works well, what you think is a good idea. Now, uh, everything that, um, that I'm gonna show you, I, we have put, oops, we have put on this uh, website here, which I will copy and paste on the chat. And and you can uh, peruse that, you know, your own time uh, later. You can share that with your friends, uh, and they can give us feedback. Um, you know, it's it's not the most polished. Uh, things are things are in different stages of development, but we will listen to uh, to what you say. And so I'm going to walk you through uh, four tools uh, that we have in the pipeline. Uh, one is uh, interact for interactive uh, differential expression. One is for uh, creating uh, gene abundance uh, histograms or ridge plots. One is uh, for creating heat maps and dot plots, and one is for creating uh, swarm plots. And uh, the difference between the first one and the last three is that the first one, uh, it requires active computation. You, you can't pre-compute all the results. And the other three, they, uh, we, we can uh, pre-compute you know, a big CSV file and then just uh, slice it and uh, allow the user to visualize it in, in different manners. Um, and so you can stay at the end of this presentation to uh, tell, tell us what you think. You can email me at eduardo at Wormbase, or you can submit a ticket uh, on the Wormbase uh, help desk uh, whenever you want, and it will get forwarded to me and to Valerio, who is uh, working with me on these tools. And so uh, let me show you uh, what this look like or what uh, we want them to look like. So the first two, that uh, that we have is uh, a tool for performing interactive differential expression. And right now it is deployed on the Sengen data set. Uh, the Sengen data set contains about 100,000 cells and about 60,000 of those are neurons and they, they contain all neurons, all 302 neurons are represented in this data in L4, L4 larva. And so, you can choose any two groups of cells. You can choose some genes to highlight. You hit submit, and then you wait uh, about 15 seconds and you'll get back a volcano plot and uh, tables of enriched and depleted genes that you can download SSV or EXO or just copy paste to do your analysis. And so here is the volcano plot. The genes that I asked to, to highlight the NLP and FLP uh, gene classes, uh, they're shown in red. And when you mouse over uh, a given gene, it will provide in addition to the gene name, gene ID, p-value and uh, log fold change, it will provide the gene descriptions. And so what this lets you do is very quickly, uh, you know, you perform a comparison and then you just go uh, to the most extreme uh, data points and you're like, what is this? Uh, and it immediately provides you a, a, a quick snippet of information. So uh, you can put that in context. And then at the bottom, you got two tables, uh, they're the same table. They're just sorted uh, by different values. One is sorted by uh, decreasing log flow change. So 
uh, this side of the of the plot, and the other started by uh, increasing log fold change. So this side of the plot, uh, you can sort them by p value, by gene, by log fold change, or you can search for specific uh, genes, and then. If you want, you can download as an Excel file or as a CSV, or you can just copy it. And then you can uh, uh, go on uh, with your analysis. Eduardo, I just wanted to mention that we want to leave some time for questions. So it's okay. so now, we have 15 a, more minutes. minutes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, back to the presentation. So th that tool, um, is the one that we have um, most developed. You can you can go there. It's deployed with the Sengen data set. The other three tools that I'm going to talk about, they are still uh, in the uh, early stage of development. And so you, if you provide feedback now, uh, we will uh, really incorporate it as, as we go. Um, something that the Sengen folks did uh, when they released their data is that they allow you to visualize uh, histograms of gene expression, also called ridge plots, uh, stratified by cell type. And so this is what their plots look like. And this is, uh, this is what uh, the ones that we are going to implement uh, will look like. And you'll be able to select cell types or studies um, and, and stratify them uh, according to the groupings that the authors provided. Um, then we are planning to also provide uh, heat maps and dot plots, and they, they will be displaying the same kind of information, uh, which allows you to select a certain group of genes in a certain group of cells. Uh, and uh, you can either plot them as a traditional heat map, or you will be able to plot them as a dot plot, uh, which shows instead of a square of different colors, it shows circles of different sizes uh, for that data. Uh, and then finally, uh, we'll, we will uh, provide you with swarm plots, uh, which are uh, plots of uh, the expression of a certain genes relative to a given cell type. So in this example, uh, it's expression of STR133 relative uh, in, in all 160 cell types relative to ASJ neurons. And what these plots are is that they are very good for uh, locating um, uh, candidate marker genes. Uh, and so I, I had a link there to show you an interactive plot, but I guess it broke. Um, and so uh, this will be also interactive that allow you to mouse over and see you know, which tissue, each kind of dot uh, each dot corresponds to. Um, so in this case, uh, we used at this at Paul Sternberg lab, uh, we used this exact plot to identify new markers for ASJ. In this case, you know, all these top genes, they're, they're good candidate uh, markers. Um, so that's it. Uh, please uh, stay, stay now at the end. Uh, so that uh, you can ask questions and we can interact a little bit. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Juan and Eduardo for the excellent presentations. Uh, we are officially opening the Q&A session. We already have a couple of questions that came through the chat. We'll try to answer those first. And then uh, whoever has question can unmute and ask directly. So the, the first question we have is from Piper Hunt. Uh, is for when, how should, how would these tools be best used to help analyze a set of microarray data from C. elegans exposed to a chemical? Um, I'm not exactly sure like uh, what kind of experiments you are referring, but uh, from the question, I mean, I can imagine like uh, uh, if you have interest in study how a chemical affect um, C. elegans, like uh, first thing I would do if I were a researcher, I would take a look at the expression clusters to find out all the genes that showed uh, uh, you know, uh, change the expression by these chemicals 
by this chemical. And then I can, I may just put the list of genes to simple mind to see that expression. And I can also do a gene enrichment analysis to see, um, to see like where the genes are expressed and uh, what kind of phenotype they're involved. We have like a gene set enrichment analysis tool in, in one base. And in, you know, those genes, like we can also find out the biological processes that are involved. So, so like if you're interested in a specific chemical, like you can immediately get, you know, the pathways that are involved through high throughput and the, 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 the phenotype that are involved and also the, the tissue enrichment. So that's a, a lot of information you can explore uh, in one base. So I know like we have a list of other questions lining up, but you can always email me or email help at onebase.org uh, and uh, tell us more about your specific experiment and uh, we can give you more information about this. Thank you, Wen. Uh, we have a question from Odami. How would you do in silico target predi prediction from enriched genes? I guess this is for when, but I'm not sure. Odami, you can unmute yourself and... Uh... I think that's for Eduardo. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not Sorry. entirely sure uh, what kinds of targets uh, you're interested in. The most straightforward kind of thing to do is to predict which genes might be good markers. Um, and like I mentioned at the end of the presentation, that's what we did with those swarm plots. And it has worked uh, because the Sengen, we use the Sengen data for that. And uh, it's, it's really well annotated. So the, the, the cell type labels really correspond uh, to, to uh, uh, only one kind of neuron. So if you see that a gene is only expressed there, uh, it's probably gonna be a good marker. Uh, so that's what we did, but I'm not sure uh, what other kinds of targets uh, uh, the question referred to? Um, yeah, hello. Hey. Yes. So um, in terms of the targets, I, I was referring to targets that could serve as drug targets, draggable targets. So um, after performing the differential ex expression of the genes, um, would like to, I'd like to know if out of the differential express, express genes, you could um, actually get um, to know which of the genes can, which could serve as drug targets and could go through the drug design pipeline. So that is basically what I'd wanted to find out. I see. From the single cell data, you, you only can tell expression. Right, and so if you want to design drugs, uh, you need to, to have a much broader context that uh, relies on more than just expression. You need to know the pathways, and you need to know uh, the structure of of the molecules in question and who binds to whom. And so, with just the tools that I showed you, uh, it, you wouldn't be able to do that. But they might be able to inform uh, which genes might present reasonable targets, because, for example. Uh, if you see uh, a list of enriched or depleted genes, and then you mouse over and you see uh, they all belong to, to a certain pathway uh, in the gene description, uh, that, that could fit into the rest of your uh, pipeline. But you, you need a lot of domain knowledge in order to perform, uh, uh, to select target for drug discovery. Yeah. Hi, um, if I may ask a question. This is mm -hmm. Akanksha from Seattle. Um, so I was wondering, so both in Taylor and Packer, they had to do an extension of the three prime UDRs because of low UMI cells that were mm -hmm. getting missed. Um, and I was wondering if on Wormbase, uh, there are updated reference transcriptomes that you could use to build those data sets uh, for your, we are doing some single cell experiments. So we were just wondering if we have to recreate those or if they exist on Wormbase that we can download. I don't know that those are available on Warmbase, but they are available on the supplements of the paper. So you can yes. get them on the Right, no, I mean like with the updated annotations as Warmbase comes along, um, you know, ah. um, whether whether there's an updated version of those. Uh, I don't know that there is, uh, but I'm not up to date on that. Okay, thanks. 
thank you. Um, we have a question from Mike Rieger. A single cell is typically enriched in ability to estimate lowly expressed genes. Does the differential expression tool have some explanation on how the data are filtered and are the filters tweakable? Ah, um, so uh, there is a little bit of explanation on uh, the framework that we used, which is called the CVI tools. Um, if you look at the, the GitHub repository, uh, uh, you can see the actual original data that was used to generate it. And there is a Google Colab notebook that can actually uh, perform the same, uh, the same steps. Uh, and so you can actually rerun the code by yourself. Uh, uh, on, the, on the online tool that we provide, the only thing that you can do is select cell types to compare. And what we're planning to do is to allow you to, you know, once we onboard the Packer data, we will allow you to select, in addition to cell types, you'll allow you to filter by condition. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, you, you get all the genes that you can get uh, on, the, on the volcano plot, you know, all 10,000 genes. It's just that most of them are at the base. Most of them are, uh, you know, low uh, code change. Um, with regards to how the data is filtered, um, what I do when I'm, uh, I'm, I'm processing the data with SCVI is I uh, don't keep genes that have less than uh, 500 counts on the, on the entire data set. And the reason why I do that is because you know, very low numbers of counts can be ascribed to um, sequencing errors. And uh, if you have very little data, SCVI is a deep learning framework uh, that uses variation alt encoders, if you have very little data, it will not be able to learn a good representation of that data. And so uh, the stuff that you get back in your, uh, in your volcano plot, it would not be uh, very confident. And so I throw away the genes that have very few counts. And then I, you know, I'm left, left with about 10 or 11,000 genes that have above uh, 500 counts in the entire data set. But if you want to do to redo the entire pipeline, go to the GitHub repo. There's a there's a Jupyter uh, notebook that uh, that you can run. Yeah, and uh, I'm happy to answer more questions about uh, CBI. Mike, does that answer your question? Okay, uh, we have time for one last question before we end the webinar. You can either type it in the chat or directly ask when or Eduardo. Sorry, thank you. That does answer my question. Thank you. So before we end, is that okay for me to run? A, well, I think we are, we are closing now. Yeah, almost closing. If nobody asks a question. Yes, you can run the poll. When is that what you wanted to do? Yes, uh, let me run a quick poll to see how many people are using the Alliance of uh, Genome Resource. And we are going to merge into the Alliance uh, in a couple of years. So so we want to know how many one-based users know about Alliance. And, you know, and we're considering running a webinar to introduce Alliance Genome to our users. And so your feedback would be really appreciated. So everything we're talking about today, uh, we're considering taking them to the Alliance. And if someone, you know, uh, wants to stay for a few minutes and and uh, chat about uh, the single cell tools, if you have specific, you know, uh, suggestions, I'm happy to hang out for for a few more minutes. Yeah, I can keep. We can keep the meeting uh, running after the top of hour. I will stop recording. We can stop recording, but you can stay for a few minutes if you still want to talk to Eduardo. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a one minute poll, and I'm going to end the poll now. Thank you.
Thank you, Wen. All right, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, again, if you have additional questions, please reach out to help at warmbase.org. And for people who want to stay on to talk to Eduardo, feel free to, to do so. Bye, everyone.